It is such an exciting time to be a filmmaker right now. I do not believe that the notion that the cinema is dying or dead with all this because it's amazing what technology can do to the cinematic storytelling. When I went to um, film school, at that time you would go to film school for two reasons. One, to get with a great teachers and fellow geeks, nerds, people that you didn't really have when you went, were in high school with each other, but you got there and you were the, the like kind. You were a tribe, and you could learn from each other as well as the teachers. And the second reason you went was to get access to equipment. <laughs> Seriously. Now, you know, like we've been, been seeing, you know, your, your iPhone... Your computer is a movie studio and a distribution outlet. And it's so exciting. But what's great about film is that it constantly reinvents itself. You know, as Henry showed us, um, it, it started as a sheer novelty of kind of images moving on the screen and stuff like that. And people were like, ah, you know. And... And then it went, and every step of the way as a new technology started being added, sound, color, what happens is the film grammar of the storytelling evolves and changes as well. The technology goes directly with the evolution of the storytelling. The way films kind of look, you know, it started with, if you've seen the, the, the you know, in museums, and, and uh, the new Academy Museum will have them. But, but you know, the old 35 millimeter motion picture cameras, and then when they got into color with a three strip Technicolor, where three strips of 35 millimeter were going through one camera, these things weighed hundreds of pounds, and they had to be on dollies and cranes and all like that. That was the film grammar of the day because of the limitations of the technology that the films were being shot, that set up what we've kind of learned is film grammar. And, and it, then as it came on to the lighter cameras, you know, of, of handheld cameras, of steady cams, of on and on and on, even all the way down to now, you know, we've been studying, trying to figure out how to do in the computer you know, what is, there's a unique thing to a GoPro. There's a unique thing to a, an iPhone and the way things are shot and the way it's held. And it just gives it a vibrancy that you've never been able to have before. And I believe that new film grammar is going to be coming from these, these things. The same goes for editing. You know, I remember when, um, when MTV first came out. It introduced an unbelievable style of editing that, that had never been done before, the quick cuts and so on, because it was made for television, not made for the big screen, so you can get, get by with really, really fast cuts. Well, it made its way to the big screen. It fundamentally changed the way films are shot. If you look at, you look at great like car chases, say, and one of the most famous is Bullet. <laughs> I mean, in comparison to some of the new stuff now, it's like, oh, my God, it's so fast. It's like it evolves, it changes, and it's because, in great part, because of the technology, you know? In my own field in animation, a seminal film, you know, in the history of animation is Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. You know, Walt Disney, the first feature-length film. People thought Walt was insane. What? You mean you would actually... People aren't going to sit still for a feature-length cartoon. Are you nuts? You know? But Walt was a visionary. Walt saw beyond, you know, what people were used to. They were used to the short cartoon. And it's interesting how people, the general public cannot see beyond what they're used to. There's a famous statement that Henry Ford says, that before the Model T, 
if you ask people what they want, they would say a faster horse. My own partner at Pixar for 25 years, Steve Jobs, kind of, he, he, he never liked market research, never did market research for anything. He said it's not the audience's job to tell us what they want in the future. It's for us to tell them what they want in the future. If you use technology correctly, you can change opinions overnight. There's a great statement I love, is that you only get one chance to make a first impression. And first impressions are nearly impossible to get people off of if they have the wrong impression. I remember when I first saw computer animation. It wasn't being used for much at the time. It was really geometric, really sterile, cold. But I was blown away by it. Not by what I was seeing, but the potential I saw in it. That it was true three-dimensionality with a control that we had in hand-drawn animation. There had been stop-motion animation for years, but it was all straight-ahead animation. Didn't quite have the same life that a classic hand-drawn an Disney animated film had. I saw the potential in computer animation. And it was like, this is great. You know, this is great. Everybody, can you see this? And everybody's going like, it looks like it's too sterile. No, I don't like it, you know? And I'm like, and, and, and I realized they were judging from what exactly they were seeing. You know, people really always push back, saying it's too cold, too sterile. In the early days of computer graphics, um, it found its way into uh, special effects. And, but, if you remember in the early days, they only used computer graphics for showing a computer readout the inside of a, um, the inside of a computer or com something that was meant to be computer generated. Um, but there was, there was some people who didn't understand the medium and thought it could do everything it could. There was this company that tried and sold Disney when they were making a movie called Something Wicked This Way Comes. On, they had worked on Tron, did some effects, and they had a very charismatic kind of effects guy that convinced them that they could create this magical circus that would erect itself. This evil circus comes to town. And so Disney bought in on it, and they, they worked for a very long time. I had a very dear friend working on it. And it was way beyond what the computer could do at that time. When it came, you know, when, when it, they, they finished the sequence and it was cut in, I remember see, seeing this. I got to see the rough cut of it. It was like, you know, beautifully shot, you know, um, period film going up to the thing. All of a sudden, it's like, what is this? I felt like spaceships were landing or something. It was so cold and sterile and had no reality to it at all. And they end up cutting the entire sequence out of the film. It's not, it's on, you know, somewhere buried you know, in, in the earth somewhere. It, is, it did not make it in the final film. That set back computer graphics in the, the effects world years because everybody remembered that experience and it wasn't there. It was because people didn't understand what the technology could do. About six years after that, I was working at um, Lucasfilm Computer Division and Dennis Muren, the brilliant Dennis Muren, effects director at ILM, came over to me. And he said, we have this effect in a film called Young Sherlock Holmes. Steven Spielberg produced Barry Levinson directing. And we don't know how to do it. I'm thinking computer graphics. And it was a, a, a very old stained glass window in English church where a priest gets shot with a dart starts hallucinating, and a stained glass knight jumps out, made of glass, jumps out of, of the, the window and menaces him down um, the center aisle of the church, causes him to get scared so much he runs out and gets run over by a carriage. Had to fear, get, put the fear in God, in, the fear in him so much that he would run and eventually to his death. 
It was only six shots. We said, let's try it. And it was some of the hardest things we've ever did. But I'll never forget when it came out, effects industry people from all over the world had no idea how it was done. But it worked. It fit in there. It was nominated for an Oscar for Best Visual Effects. And I'll never forget Siskel and Ebert back then, where they got to choose their, their, their Oscars. Remember they used to do that back then? <coughs> and Gene Siskel sat there and was like, I have no idea how they did that, but that is amazing. You know? And Roger goes, I know how they did it. I'll tell you. He goes, I don't want to know. <laughs> it was that really funny. But we were so, so excited. It was, but it was like really focusing on the, you know, understanding the technology and pushing it to places that we couldn't. But it was the goal was to make it so invisible, the technology invisible. When we became Pixar in 1986 and we started working towards our first feature film, I remembered all those projects. And I was blessed by, number one, loving the, the medium of computer animation. Just so interested in it. And working with the people who basically invented much of computer animation. And we were pushing it all along. So we really understood what the computer could and could not do. And so at that time, when we rendered things, everything kind of looked plasticky. I mean, we all know that because of the... Monday Night Football and ABC News and all the, the flying logos that, that was going around. And so we started thinking about a subject matter that lent itself to the medium at that time. Everything looks like plastic, so hmm, what if the characters were made of plastic? What if they were toys? And it's one of the reasons why we kind of leaned into um, Toy is becoming alive as a subject for our very first film, feature film, Toy Story. And if you watch it to this day, you know, yeah, if you really know CG, you look at the people are weird. The, the, the humans are always the weirdest, the hardest to create. And back then it was really impossible. But it was, the story was not about them. We, we had feet and hands, and that was about a few, occasionally faces. It was about the toys that lent himself to the medium at that time. And we chose toys that really kind of worked for that. And in fact, it was better in CG than any other medium we could have done because we could make Buzz Lightyear feel like he's made of plastic and ball and socket joints and we had screws and scratches and decals and all this stuff that you could not have done in any other medium. And so when it came out, our, our, you know, our main focus was, was not the technology. What I was scared about was that the people would be like, oh, it's the first computer animated feature film. And we made sure that Disney and all around the world, that you don't sell it as the first CG film. You sell it as a really great motion picture because that's how we made it. We, we really focused on, 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 on the story in hiding the technology. And it came out, and, and people loved it. And you watch it today, and it's just as entertaining as the day it came out. It's, by the way, in November, it'll be 20 years old. So it makes a lot of you feel really old. Yeah. And, and so if you do it right the first time, like I said, you have only one chance to make a first impression. Unlike this, the Something Wicked This Way Comes experience, it took years before someone was willing to try CG and effects again. Toy Story was the number one film of that year, 1995, that came out. It was a huge hit. And everybody started looking at this as a viable filmmaking medium. Overnight, the opinion changed because the technology was used in the right way, telling the right story. We, can't, we, we were trying to guess, we're coming up on the 20th anniversary, we were trying to figure out like how many CG animated feature films have been made and released in the world today, and we were thinking it had been over 100, some 255 in 20 years. That blew us away, too. You know, um, I, I, 
Alfred Hitchcock is one of my favorite filmmakers, and one of the reasons why I've studied and admired his films is that guy used new technology in incredible ways. But y it was completely invisible in everything he made. Completely invisible. But you, you study the film and you realize there's no way he could have made that film, that shot, without that technology. But he didn't want you to notice it. He did not want you to notice it. Um, when, we focus on entertaining people in new ways. And if you focus on the technology too much, you get caught up. It's, I tell you, technology is so much fun. And it's so sexy. And so you get caught up into it. But, but there, there's a side to it that you can't forget that it's not the technology that entertains people. It's what you do with the technology. And, and it's really important, I believe, to make the technology invisible. But have it really push to do something new. And so people just look and go, wow, what's that? That's amazing. And that's when you really, I think, make real breakthroughs. Um, if you really love a technology, if you really, 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 really love a technology, then dig into it. Learn as much as you can. It's fun. I mean, that's what I did with CG. I mean, I was trained by these great Disney artists. I drew, and it was all about story, character drawing, all that stuff. But when I got into the computer graphics, I was like, oh, my God, this is so much fun. And I wanted to learn as much as I could, you know. I didn't feel like I, I couldn't program, but I wanted to understand, wait, how does particle systems work? How does the renderer work? How did, you know, how, all this stuff. Because then I would start, the more you dig into the technology, the more you learn it, you are going to get ideas that you would have never thought of without knowing your technology and start thinking about things, you know. The kind of shots you can get from an iPhone that you cannot get with any other camera. Use it. GoPros. Use it. You know? Be inspired by it. Try things. You know? It's digital. Get another memory card, for God's sakes. <laughs> you know? And it's like you will start creating ideas that, that just start lending itself to this thing and start looking new. When you start doing something that's really truly w r new, you will hear this. It's not going to work. You will hear that. It's not going to work. Walt Disney heard it. I heard it with CG. People are going to sit still for it. So cold. Computer animation so cold. Really? No, I don't think so. You know, it was, it, it, you think about it. It's true for color, sound, feature length animation, CG. I mean, it's like the first, you know, we're, we're the first feature film shot on an iPhone. Eh, it's not going to work. Yeah, it's going to work. It's going to be awesome. First feature film shot with a GoPro, it's going to be awesome in the hands of the right people. Um, and the reason why they say this is it's because it's not what people are used to. You know, before the Model T, you ask people what they want, they're going to want a faster horse. It's not what they're used to. I remember sitting with Steve and he was sitting there, and he would like look off and wax poetically sometime and just think. It was so fun to hear what he would say. And he goes, you know what? Everybody has a cell phone. But everybody I know hates their cell phone. But we all have them. He goes, I want to make a phone that people love. And that was the origins of the iPhone. It didn't come from market testing or anything like that. It just came from this thing. I want to make something people love. Can you imagine life without this now? I mean, my God. When I started working uh, with CG, you know, I could not wait for the tools 
to become commonplace. In the early days when it was, um, you know, when SIGGRAPH was the only place that you could go and see computer graphics, it was always fun, and everybody would cheer for, you know, reflective, clear balls floating over a checkerboard and stuff and be amazed by it. <laughs> you know, and it was in a world where it was interesting because it was a world where all of the, the, the art and the CG was being created by the, the, the guys who were writing the program. There was no such thing as off-the-shelf software. There was no tools available. People were writing their software and then creating it. And they were kind of the artistic guys within the computer world. And, and they would... Um, and they, they, they were just showing off the technology. And I kept thinking to myself, it's like, yeah, but they're really ugly. This is like boring. You know, let's entertain people. And I couldn't wait because I always viewed the technology as simply a tool. Can you imagine the guy who invented the pencil and all of the things that that invention has brought the world? And that's what I was feeling like with CG. I couldn't wait to get it just in the hands of everybody to see what they would do. And it's, it's that, you know, the, we've heard the term disruptors a lot, right, lately. I loved when Steve went back to, to Apple, the first ad, before he had any products out. He just changed their whole advertising in the Think Different campaign. And I think it's one of the most brilliant advertising campaigns because it was not about a product. It was about a way of thinking and, and seeing and feeling. Steve came to me privately when he was, uh, they had just bought Next, his company Next, Apple did. And they invited him. They wanted him to come back to be interim CEO. And he asked my permission. I was so, like, touched Right, because Pixar was one of his babies, and he spent a lot of time with us. And he went there, and we were talking about it, and he said simply, I asked him, do you want to go? Do you want to do this? And he said, he said, yeah. He said, I think the world would be a better place with Apple in it. And he, he was feeling at the time that it may not survive. Can you imagine a world without Apple in it and the products that they brought? You know, and, and excuse me for any PC users out there. It's like <laughs> I'm I'll be I'll admit I'm really biased. But but you know, the medium in which we use is really just simply tools for expressing your art. Your goal as a filmmaker is to entertain. It's a, and, and to entertain people is about story. It's about characters. It's about connecting with that audience. It's making that connection where you really deeply entertain audience. But it's not just an art form that we're in. It's a business. And this is the film business. Enter entertaining stuff simply just does better. It does better. You know, if you can make people laugh and cry and feel things with the film you make, you will be successful. No matter what, no matter what medium you've created it in, no matter any way you've distributed it, it doesn't matter. It all comes down to your knowledge skills. What makes a good story? How can I tell it properly? You know, people get so excited about new technologies. You know, I've had the question so many times by young people. It's like, oh, you know, I want to I do computer. I wanna, what software should I use? Or like that. And I go, you know what? You, the, in your lifetime, the software and the technology will change so drastically. It doesn't matter. What matters is when you're young and you get excited about this, learn the fundamentals. It sounds so boring to people, to young people, when they have, they can make a movie so quickly and release it to the world and get millions of likes. It's so boring. I know how to do that. 
Trust me, you don't. There's the fundamentals of good storytelling, the fundamentals of film grammar. The f even though it's made with old Mitchell cameras and stuff like that, learn it. Learn the fundamentals of animation. Learn the fundamentals of, of physics and things like that, of, of basic color, basic design. The more you get into this is the foundation of the building you know, of your career. The more that you understand the fundamentals, then as you get into new technology, you'll know exactly what to do with them. And your work will not be about the technology. It'll be about connecting and entertaining people. And it doesn't matter the length of your film. 30 seconds, 5 minutes, 22 minutes feature length. It needs a story. It needs a beginning, a middle, and an end. It needs to really deeply connect with people. But there is big differences between storytelling at 30 seconds or a feature film. Big differences. When we did, we, we went from short films. We did a series of short films in the beginning of Pixar. And we did television commercials. And then we were, we were thinking the next step for us would be to do it like a Christmas special. And so we thought about, you know, that this is what we, uh, the ne next step that we needed to do. But, but really it was like, you know, we made a deal with Disney and Steve and Disney at the time, and we just threw us into the deep end and we're, we were developing a feature film. It was amazing what we didn't know. <laughs> you know, but, but I went back to my traditional training that I had learned from my mentors, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, and the great Disney animators that, that were still working at the studio when I started there. And the fundamentals of animation that they kept talking about. Because I would go to them. I, my drawing was okay, it wasn't great. You know, and I would go to them for help with the scene we're working on it. And Ollie Johnson would take and flip this big stack of things and look at it, and he would turn to me. And I was expecting some thing about arcs and lines and silhouette value and all that stuff. And he would turn and he goes, John, what's the character thinking? And it was amazing to me that, that just that simple statement, it was like, it was not about the drawing. It was never about the drawing to them. It was about that character and what it's thinking. And through pure movement, they taught me to bring a character to life and give it an emotion, a personality, a uniqueness. And it was done through just pure motion. And so when I started working with a computer, I just brought that technology with me. And as we started developing the story, it was always about emotion. It was always about emotion from the day one with Toy Story. It's about emotion, making you feel. And that's what, you know, I've admired Walt Disney so much my whole life. And part of it is because he entertained people like no other person in history has ever done. The way that he makes you feel when you watch his movies, the way he makes you feel, the way he makes you feel when you, walk, when you go through that tunnel under the train station at Disneyland and you're transported, the way he makes you feel, it's about emotion, you know, and that connection. You know, Walt always said, for every laugh, there should be a tear felt like that core emotion. That would became the hallmark of what we tried to do at Pixar, to do it with a new technology. I think the biggest thing for us is that we studied films. We watched films religiously. We were making, we, with Toy Story, it was a buddy picture. We watched every buddy picture we could find and analyzed it. Good ones, and it's very important to watch bad ones too. No, seriously, it's very important. You watch a bunch of good ones and watch a few bad ones, and pretty soon you'll start seeing, huh, this one, Defiant Ones did this. I'm not going to say it. These other films did that, and that's why it doesn't quite work. Interesting, okay. And you start understanding what they did and it, you more and more. And it, don't copy things. It's about understanding and learning. Um, 
Very, very, very important. Do not work in a vacuum. Do not work in a vacuum. Right? You may be the filmmaker and doing something on your own, but you have to surround yourself with trusted people. You have to, you know, you get so immersed in your work. You will. Everybody does. You get so immersed in, in your work. I guarantee you, you will, you will not be able to see the forest from the trees. Frankly, you'll be studying the pine needles and worrying about them. And you need someone to help you back up and take a look at the forest and see where things are working or not working. Um, and you need to surround yourself with people whose judgment you trust and they can be brutally honest with you. And you have to be able to, look, showing as an artist, showing unfinished work to people is really difficult, is really hard. It always is hard. It always will be hard. It never gets any easier. But you have to do it. Andrew Stanton, my partner at creative partner at Pixar, has this fantastic phrase that I use all the time. Be wrong as fast as you can. Trust me, when you go from an outline to a treatment, your first treatment sucks. And you do revisions and talk to people like that. You get something working really great. Go to your first draft of the script. It sucks. You do it a bunch of times. And for us, we go to story reels. The first story reel sucks but the but the longer you go it's, i'm not quite ready yet let wait, wait, give me a little more time give me a little more time like that it's not going to help the problem right you're just going to be polishing you're not going to be seeing where it's not working get it up there throw it up there as fast as you can talk about it tear it back down put it back up there keep doing that surround yourself with really people that you trust you know be thirsty for knowledge be thirsty for knowledge. It will always make your work better. You know, the market is changing really, 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 really quickly. And really, who knows what the business will look like 10 years from now, you know? But I, I know one thing for sure, that if you create characters people connect with and tell stories that deeply entertain and move them, the audience will come. They'll come no matter how you show it. And they'll keep coming back. In this business, remember this simple thing, I believe truly, success breeds autonomy. The more that you can do this and show time and time and time again that you can deeply entertain people, you will be able to keep making your art and people will leave you alone. <laughs> Trust me, they do. Success breeds autonomy. And so, really, you know, if you make great work, you can, also, you can set the terms, too, of, of like what you want to be doing. So it's stuff that really moves and excites you. So be inspired by amazing new technology. Be inspired by all the stuff the speakers talked about like this. But make sure that you're entertaining people. Make sure you understand the fundamentals of storytelling and film grammar and animation or whatever. Design color. Understand those. Because that is what you will use with the new tools to create things that really deeply entertain people. Thank you very much.